Hi everybody and welcome to episode number 11. Today's video is going to be a little shorter than normal because I've got uh, some things going on and got some visitors over and whatnot so don't want to take up too much of their time. So I figured what I'd do is show you guys some of the differences between revision A and revision B of my USB to GPIB adapter since I've been doing so much work on that lately and also show off some of the, just the board itself, you know, uh, some of the in-progress ones, some of the completed ones that I've already assembled in, during the past couple days. And uh, overall, just, you know, take a good look at it because uh, I've been working pretty hard at it. So let's get, uh, well, right to it and start off with looking at just the board. And here we are. Here is revision B. Uh, board of my USB GPIB adapter. So there's a lot of changes that I made to the previous one, but um, I'll, I'll show a comparison shot between this one and the previous one um, with fully built up ones to get a better understanding. So these showed up on Monday, just this past week, uh, from a Canadian company called Crimp Circuits, located in Toronto, and they do indeed manufacture their boards in Canada. Uh, the previous boards were also done in Canada. Um, that was just a quick prototype, so I only had two boards, and that was from Alberta Printed Circuits, and, well, they did theirs in Alberta. So some of the things, just while I'm kind of poking around here, just to show you what some of the early differences are, is that um, here in the corner, I added some LEDs, some, of course, current loading resistors for them, the open source hardware logo, my name, made in Canada because the boards are made in Canada they're assembled in Canada by yours truly um, and if I ever do go to automated assembly it'll be assembled in Canada too here's a reset switch and this is one of the mistakes I actually made in the design but thankfully it's not a problem because I can easily correct for it during assembly I forgot that um, this pin on these push button switches is also directly connected to this one because the idea was I wanted the reset switch to be pulled to ground when you push it, right? So connect these two together, right? So that's good. But these two are permanently connected together internally to the switch. So whoops. So I just clip that lead off and don't, don't even bother soldering it in. But uh, if I ever do a rev C, I'll just might as well just correct for that so I don't have to be clipping them off every single time. Uh, other changes, of course, is that there's actually uh, all, the, all the empty space I, I turn into ground on the top layer as opposed to the original one, which only had traces. Um, so I went ahead and filled it all in. Uh, bottom's pretty much the same as to before. However, I made sure to separate a couple of the little things. Here, this was too close together before, so this was a little ground island. And then thus, this ground pin here wasn't actually connected to anything. Um, made sure to include at least a little bit of space there. I know that like, there's nothing actually connected to the ground there. So it's not like any current will be actually going into there. I just wanted everything to at least be connected a little bit. Here, as you can see, we're going... The, the programming header is on the side this time as opposed to across the bottom. Um, so I had to change the uh, programming pins there where they're located but that made space thankfully for that uh, switch there. The reason for putting that over there was because you actually wouldn't be able to I, ex I think I explained this before but the programming header here the actual pick kit the uh, enclosure for it would hit the USB connector and then thus you wouldn't be able to actually program it without double stacking the header pins so um, this is what it came in. This, uh, this there was a hundred of them there. As you can see, I've already taken out a few. Um, and yeah, it's like just basically shrink wrap with a bunch of tape on it. So they did a really good job. I'm I'm, I'm very happy with all the support that they gave me. The company gave me the entire way. Um, you know, everything from just um, helping me with business side of things to. Um, you know, suggesting programs I need to use to verify the bin file and stuff like that. I'd never encountered that before. Um, but we'll take a closer look comparing it to um, APC in a second. So, yeah, I've been doing some assembly. So here are the latest ones that I've been hand assembling. 
Now there's a whole bunch of them. Here's another one, right? Like, I do them in batches of five, is what I've been doing. So there's five currently in this phase right now, where as you see it, right, where where one pad on each of them has been, uh, I've been, uh, I added just a little bit of extra solder to them. And the chips are on, LEDs are on, a couple of the caps are on, um, but still quite a bit of work to go on, on these boards. So it takes me, takes me several hours to do, to do the five of them all together. And here's a built up one. So as you can see, um, I, there's a whole bunch of individual resistors there that I put each individually on. The crystal, I used my A10 hot air rework station that I talked about in another video, and that works just lovely. Once I figured out the settings that I want, how much solder to add to the pads underneath, and like temperature settings, oh, it's, it's really quick to add that crystal on, um, which is really nice. So of course, USB connector, bottom, and some hardware that I included for actually mounting the, um, uh, you know, just making sure that we're utilizing those stress relief holes there uh, on the USB connect, uh, on the GPIB connector end. Um, yeah, so I think next time I order more hardware, I will order just slightly smaller. This was M3. I think I'll get M2 2.5 uh, next time because I wanted it to not actually uh, have any difficulties going in through the hole, just go, you know, just slide it in, put the nut on, be done. Well, this is actually just a little tight, so I do have to screw the, uh, screw the machine screw in and then put the bolt on. So the problem with that is, is that I, you know, these, these machine screws that I got are, uh, the, the threading is a little weak. It's, it's not necessarily t tough enough to be biting into the unthreaded metal in the in the connector right there um, so what happens sometimes is that the threading ends up getting messed up a little bit on the screws and then the bolt doesn't go on and since I don't have at home a M3 wrench I uh, am screwed so I'll show you uh, one that I did mess up for example This one right here. So I was kind of on autopilot when I was assembling the screws and look at that angle that I put in there. Whoops. And then in the process I also managed to <clears throat> strip the screw. But I'll get that out once I get the some you know some of the tools from work and then actually put just a regular one in that is functional. So let's not look at that one though. So I get a proper one. Get those bolts out of the way there. And we'll take a look also at Rev A. All right, so here we go. So there's Rev A compared to Rev B. So this way now we can see some of the changes a little better here. So I moved, you know, moved these um, load crystals here a little bit to make space for the heading for the uh, uh, for putting the uh, programming header on the side here. All right, so rotate that out of the way because you know as we talked about in my original revision. I had to double stack the header pins there, and of course you can also see all the all the all the copper that I did include this time uh, into all the unfilled areas. Um, you know, just just for added noise suppression, you know, so that there's actually more located underneath each of the devices. You know, underneath the microcontroller, it was mostly actually uh, the 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 bottom layers ground was cut out because as you can see kind of right here right those vias go under and they come up and then they come out here well they come out somewhere in there underneath the actual chip but then because of that most of the ground is is not not existent there so on this one on the on the upper layer you can see the at least there's some more ground going on right so Better than nothing, and this time now, then there's more in the areas where there isn't on the other side. Whatever, something like that. Not like it really needed it, but eh, looks nicer that way though. So there's that. 
And of course, you know, Made in Canada, Open Source Hardware Logo, Rev B, My Name, 2012, you know, changes that don't really matter. All the rest, all the resistors are all the same, parts are the same there. Yeah, I changed the crystal so this one was 20 megahertz. And if you listen to my previous video blog, uh, episode 10, the serial baud rate calculations, you'll have heard that I replaced it with a 18.432 megahertz crystal. That gives uh, a proper division down to um, the higher baud rate that I wanted. What is it? 11... 1153 200 I don't know whatever that whatever that is exactly um, that will accurately generate that so that's what I wanted and the reset switch was really nice uh, I didn't think I was originally going to need it in my original revision but the inclusion of it was really good because um, this way the end user can upgrade the firmware on it. So I'm, I'm putting a I'm putting a bootloader on it. I'm going to be using the tiny bootloader, and then you can use the program, the the the, the any of the free programs to update the uh, the actual code on it. You know, like you know, just like how an Arduino works, right? You know, you burn the bootloader to it, and then just through software, you don't actually need the programmer. You can update your code on it. So it's the same thing. So then I'll provide um, any updates or bug fixes or additional features. For example, once I finally get around to um, implementing serial polling, that'll be pushed out as a uh, feature update. The LEDs were also something that I added out of functionality because previously when I'd always be testing this, excuse me, I wouldn't know if, well, the thing was getting power. Was it plugged in? Um, you know, how do I know what's going on with it, right? So I included a power LED, so it's just straight up connected to the power rail there. So that one's green. And the other one here, you can't see it from this far away maybe, but it says error right there. And this is a red LED. So what happens is that in the code, when the micro first turns on, so after the bootloader though, so once it leaves the bootloader and goes into my code, um, it'll turn on the red LED, and then once it's done taking over the interface bus, it turns off the LED. So anytime the device resets itself, that LED will turn on. So if it's just so if for some reason it's continuously resetting itself, that red LED will flash each time it resets itself for for um, a small period of time. So not an ideal error where it doesn't doesn't hang around saying hey something happened, you know, but uh, again, that can be always done in a software update if I figure out a better way for uh, to give that information out for uh, for like the user for when an error has happened. Um, also the USB connector changed just because I think this one was on sale or whatever. Same stuff, works just as fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much all the changes between the two of them. We can flip it over if you want to see. Um, so there's my little there's my little fix for in Rev A for the uh, isolated ground there. And oh, I didn't actually change it. That was always a slight gap there. But as you can see, this here is cut down much shorter because I don't I, I didn't actually need all those vias there. They're they're resistors that are all right beside each other. So why not why not just make the trace? all right there, right, you know. So, so a couple little silly things that I overlooked originally. And here's the thing I was talking about with all the ground underneath the processor kind of being cut away. That's pretty much the uh, in entirety of it. So a couple little changes here and there on the bottom. Overall, not bad. Let's see if I can get a shot of the silk screen too. Okay, so there's the Rev A silk screen. And it's very nice, very sharp. Uh, Ignore some of, of course, my poor soldering job. Some of the first ones that I did. And here, over in Rev B, see if I can get in focus. It's it's good, but it's just not quite as good. You can see the R's. It's uh, the the little loopy bit in the R. It's filled in, for example, on some of them. Um, oh, this one I didn't clean up. Whoops. 
All the connections are good though, so don't worry about that in case you're looking at it and going, Oh man, he sucks at solder. I'm never going to order from him. Uh, I, I have visually inspected each solder joint with my loop and they are perfectly fine. They all do indeed work. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, the uh, silk screen is a little messier uh, on on this from this company, but overall not bad, right? It's a little see. You can see that there's a clear defined R on APC, but of course I did pay more money for Rev A per board than I did for Rev B. So uh, yeah. That's about it. And just before we finish, here's all the all the things that I'm kind of working on right now. Here's the board that I just took out of the package, just to show you guys what, what it looks like a baby bike. Here's the ones that I started last night. Yes, that's right. I spent I spent some of my evening on St. Patrick's Day soldering. So I know that some people just love going out and uh, going to the bars, but uh, did that once, and that's not for me. So <laughs> and. Um, there's the ones that are already done, except for, of course, the one that i got to fix the screw on. Uh, so there's ten of them done here. Well, okay, I guess nine and a half. And then there's the one in my room that I built up uh, by itself before I started doing them in batches, just to make sure I didn't completely bugger something up in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the stuff. But that's when I found out that the switch um, had a slight mistake in it. So it's a good thing I did that first, checked it, and then just started clipping off the uh, one lead off of all the uh, off of all the switches so uh, yeah that's that's it and I'm gonna put them up on the internet for sale soon so hope you guys are interested in that so I hope you guys enjoyed the episode you know I don't have my own website yet to actually have like a e-commerce shopping system and everything like that for anybody that's that is indeed interested in purchasing them so the first ones are going to be offered probably through uh, through contacting me directly, I will probably put some up on eBay. Uh, there's a website called InMojo, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, it's a website devoted to selling open source hardware electronics. You know, uh, anybody, anybody that's offering a product that is released under an open source hardware license can uh, put it up for sale on it. So, you know, of course they get their couple percent or whatever. So I've been working on making accounts on, you know, on PayPal accounts and Emojo accounts and working technicalities out between them and all, all sorts of things. But mm, excuse me again. Um, I'll be sure to post that information um, once everything's all worked out. I gotta get I gotta get PayPal. See, when I was making my PayPal account for this for 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 this specifically, I made a business account but then there was a technicality with that and if your bank account is under your own name then blah 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 blah. It's... Anyways I, I'm waiting now for them to switch it to a premier account. Anyways it doesn't really matter to any of this but um, before we go I just want to put out one thing. I'm wearing a t-shirt it's like over 20 degrees outside and it's still technically the winter. It's been it's been ridiculously hot for the winter for the past couple of days here. And uh, yes, again, I, I live in Canada, so this is uh, this has been very confusing for for for, for me for the past couple of days. I just figured I'd, I'd I, I would just mention it in 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 closing here that I'm, I may be from Canada, but this is I believe this is the second warmest winter on record we've ever had, and it's basically summertime outside already. I don't know. Something's going on. So if you made it all the way to the end of this episode, okay, what I want you to use is I want you to use the word um, winter somewhere in your comments below, okay? So leave a comment below, and I want you to use the word winter somewhere. Winter or, or uh, something related to it, like, so, so winter or something to do with the seasons. How about that? Uh, winter, summer, uh, it's hot, you don't like the cold. You know, something like that, okay? Because <laughs> because it's been very confusing. All right, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.